So this project up here is the culmination of our class on networks in a global world. Within the class, we looked a lot at networks, how they form, how they exist, and global processes that are affected by networks. Um, to have a group project, what we wanted to do was focus on a prominent issue in society today. So we chose the Syrian refugee crisis, which of course has become more prominent recently with the terrorist attacks in Paris. Um, so in order to learn about this crisis and make a presentation on it, we created a website, which you can see here. Um, among other things on this website, we have a timeline of the crisis and what was going on not only with refugees, but in the war, in the Syrian civil war itself. We have additional sources where each of us were able to talk about more detailed things going on. We also made a map of refugee flows within the Middle East and Europe as well. And we also were able to talk about specific policies of countries in order to get at the why this is occurring. Um, so in order to be able to understand not only the Syrian refugee crisis, but other crises, I thought it would be useful to introduce other great migrations that have taken place in addition to the socio-political context of the refugee crisis that we're going to talk about. There are two migrations that I specifically wanted to point out, which is the great migration of African Americans in America, of course, um, which really took place between 1910 and 1970. And there were six million people who moved from the south to the north and really created an urbanized population. And in addition to that, there, the greatest migration in human history was the 14 million people who were displaced when India was partitioned in 1947 into India and Pakistan and people hoped to get on the right side of the border for their ethnic group. And the, the reason these two migrations are important are because they show different circumstances that lead to migrations, partition, I mean, racism in America, and here what we see is a civil war. Um, so having understood the place of migrations in history, it's important to understand, like I said, the socio-political context of the refugee crisis that we're going to be talking about, which in large part exists because of the Syrian civil war that is going on until today. The Syrian civil war really began in 2011 in the context of the Arab Spring that affected many, many countries in the Middle East. Um, there was a number of significant protests against President Bashar al-Assad, and he responded by violently cracking down on these protesters, and this caused a pretty quick spiral into a bloody civil war that is still going on. Um, so that's, the Arab Spring is sort of the immediate cause for the civil war. But there are, of course, underlying tensions that existed and made the Civil War able to break out. So many people view this as really a sectarian conflict in nature. And the primary tension is between Sunnis and Alawites. Because Sunnis are the majority in Syria, but the Alawites are currently ruling. And the Alawites have been ruling since the current President Assad's father took power in 1971. And the Alawites are a branch of Shia Islam, which causes, of course, the tensions with the Sunni Muslims who are the majority in Syria. And the fighting not only takes place between these two groups, but between the other significant minorities in Syria, among others, there's the Christians, there's the Jews, there's the Kurds. And the fighting has taken place with Syria, of course, the government of Syria fighting with Iran and Russia. And although they're not a state, Hezbollah, the terrorist organization that originates from Lebanon but is funded a lot by Iran and acts as their proxy, have all been very important players in fighting the rebels. As for the rebels, there is extreme and moderate rebels. Um, the extreme rebels we have all heard about a lot lately, ISIS or ISIL or the Islamic State or Daesh, they are all the same thing. Um, they are really being fought on all ends, not only by the Syrian government and their allies, but by more moderate groups because they are, of course, trying to establish an Islamic state, not just um, al-Assad. However, the moderate groups have been supported 
by Western states and their allies, like the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, among others. And we have supplied arms in order to try to help these more moderate groups, but because it's very difficult to be able to distinguish between moderate and extreme rebel groups, the Western states have also had to act on their own and issue a lot of air attacks, particularly after Paris. We're expecting to see a lot more of this. So it's within this context of the extreme violence that results uh, from the tensions that I described and the very powerful alliances and rebel groups that exist in Syria that allows for the huge refugee crisis that we're going to discuss of four million people. So next we're going to start going into more detail about the things that we actually have on the website and we're going to start by doing an explanation of this map that you see here. So the first feature of the website that we're going to discuss um, is this map. It shows the movements of Syrian refugees out of Syria and into the countries of the world. Um, we gathered our data from the, UN, from the United Nations um, database that keeps track of um, refugees moving from different countries and the flows of refugees from uh, origin countries into other countries of the world. Uh, the countries are color-coded on a gradient level. Um, red countries represent countries that take in the least amount of, of refugees, while the greener countries represent countries that take in the most amount of refugees. If we click on a country, you can see the exact amount of refugees that were taken in on that year. Um, you can see the year on the top of the map. Uh, this current image represents 2011. Um, at the bottom of the map, you can also see uh, a monthly timeline. Um, and as we scroll through the bottom, the months will change. Events on the months will change so that we can correlate uh, the number of, of, of refugees to events that are, that are occurring. And as we continue to scroll through, you can see that the year on the top of the map change. And as the year changes, the colors on the countries and the number of refugees displayed will change on the map. So you really want to be looking both at the year on the top to see the colors on the map and the months and events at the bottom to correlate um, the, 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 event, the event timeline um, with, with what is going on in the world. Um, so now Emma is going to go a little bit more detail on what we're exactly seeing on this map from year to year. Okay, so as this crisis um, broke out in March 2011, I'm going to go through um, a couple points, major changing tra transition points during these um, four years. So beginning in March 2011, um, only this was not yet a global crisis, so only a few, very few neighboring countries, including Turkey and Iraq, um, had a few Syrian refugees, or taking in a couple refugees, including um, some European countries. Germany was taking 14,800 at this time, and Sweden was taking 16,000. Um, at this time, it was much of the crisis involved um, protest and fighting within the country, within the region, and um, Syria's m membership with the Arab League was suspended at this time. Um, then, as we move into 2012, um, main. The main events during this time were re as refugee camps um, were formed and more and more people began to flee the country. At this time, we see the United Kingdom, the United States, France, and, Gulf, and the Gulf states um, begin to increase their intake in refugees. And this is when the U.S. transitions from being a red state into higher in the color gradient. Um, other surrounding countries, including Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, and Egypt, also jumped significantly in their uh, refugee intake. Then, as we move into 2013, the U.S. makes a big jump at this time, increasing their refugee intake from 1,800 to 5,180. Um, we also see a lot of the more of the surrounding countries jump at this time, including China, Peru. Bolivia, um, large European com countries, France, Italy, and Romania, and Greece intake a lot at this time. And this is correlated with um, international donors pledging for $1.5 billion to help Syrian refugees, and as well as the Syrian government. Um, a number of rebel groups agreed to meet and discuss the end of the civil Syrian civil war, 
However, this did not go through and resulted in failure. Um, our last year that we look at is 2014. Um, in 2014, um, the surrounding countries' intake of Syrian refugees grows exponentially. However, in comparison, the U.S. Um, only increases slightly. Um, in June 2014, the general elections took place, and President Bashar al-Assad was re-elected, winning with 88.7% of the votes. Um, as this crisis has continued, we see changes, fluctuations in the migration of these um, refugees, and it continues to change as more countries take in less and more, and it's interesting to see how they continue to shift. So now that we saw some global trends on refugee movements from countries to countries, we're going to talk about why, why these different trends between countries exist. So this page shows the attractiveness of different countries to refugees. Um, we looked at some European countries and some Middle Eastern countries. Um, and we uh, rated the countries based on a number of metrics from the stipend that the refugees um, receive to the amount of health uh, care that they receive, to the amount of Syrian refugees that different countries take in. Once again, each country is uh, graded um, based on color. And we took account all these metrics and created a single number. And the countries are color coded based on that single number. Um, the green countries are the most attractive, while the red countries are the least attractive. Um, and now we're going to go a little bit more in detail um, and talk a little bit more about this, about this map and some other information that we, we used to supplement it. We wanted to know why the refugees are going to these European countries, so we looked at the top 10 European countries by number of asyl asylum claims uh, in those countries, and we saw that there are great differences in the conditions that asylum seekers receive. Um, so, for example, an asylum seeker in Bulgaria will receive no monetary stipend, where, uh, whereas uh, an asylum seeker in Denmark will receive 350 euros per month on top of free housing, which makes certain countries more attractive than others. Uh, also a big factor, um, in the Netherlands, the standard time for an asylum claim to be processed is two weeks, whereas in the United Kingdom, 12 months is far from being an exception. Um, most asylum claims are uh, processed around around with them around 12 months. Um, so we see that the most attractive countries such as Sweden or Germany are also the countries which receive the most Syrian refugees which um, brings in the question of asylum shopping uh, which is refugees going to countries depending on the conditions that they will receive there and not just going to the closest safe countries. For example, if we look at Greece, it's one of the least attractive countries and it receives, um, for example, in 2015, from January to July, it only took in 3,500 um, Syrian refugees, whereas 250,000 transited by the country. So, um, so attractiveness has a big impact in the flux of refugees. Uh, if you, different countries have different policies towards refugees, which you can examine by clicking on one of the countries. Um, Germany has been at the center of the, of establishing a European refugee policy. In, in 2015, um, Merkel declared that Germany opened its doors towards Syrian refugees, and since then that's led other Ref, uh, European countries to come together and establish a quota system as well as to expand resources towards Syrian refugees. Though uh, the impact of Syrian refugees has been great, the numbers have been far greater than expected. When Merkel declared Germany's doors open towards Syrian refugees, they expected up to 800,000 Syrian refugees. Now estimates for 2015 go up to 1.5 million. So the um, the, the numbers, the countries are becoming saturated and uh, countries are restricting benefits to refugees. For example, Germany, uh, now refugees will receive vouchers instead of cash for food or uh, conditions are, are uh, tightened for, for uh, asylum seekers. And um, the great number of refugees, which is 
the greatest number that Europe has seen since um, World War II, is menacing the policy, the Schengen, um, the Schengen policy of open borders. Uh, since 2015, there have been many counts of restrictions on border crossings or a complete closing of borders. Uh, that started in June 2015 with Hungary. Though now uh, in France, even before the terror attacks of this weekend, France closed its borders supposedly for the environmental conference, but there have also been rumors that it's due to the Syrian refugees. And since the terrorist attacks, um, it's restoring border checks. And so it'll be interesting to see how the great number of refugees and the financial and um, political strain that that poses, as well as the security risks, in, uh, impact the policy, European policies and, and the future of um, Schengen. Now we're going to talk about the policies in Arab countries. So while um, refugee flows to Europe have been kind of a hot topic recently, when we talk about the majority of refugees, we're talking about 97% of them being in these six countries surrounding Syria. Um, so out of 4 million, that's a large number of refugees in these very small countries for the most part. Um, as you can see, a lot of the attractiveness scores for these countries are much lower than the ones in Europe. A lot of this has to do with um, GDP levels, has to do with human development score and index, um, but they are receiving large amounts of refugees. They are approving um, large amounts of asylum seeker applications. It's just that in these countries like Libya, like Iraq, there is already conflict in the country and so that hurts the attractiveness overall of the countries. Um, so in terms of policies, there's a little bit of a difference here um, because many of these countries aren't signees of the 1951 Refugee um, Convention and so they don't necessarily have the same language, the same kinds of policies um, that are recognized more internationally. He, and so there can be some discrepancies between how they're treated in these countries rather than more globally. However, when you look at a country like Jordan, they do call them refugee, yeah, refugees. They do um, give them a lot of the benefits that are guaranteed under that, under that refugee conference. And so it's not necessarily a deciding factor in the policies. Um, for example, um, Jordan has, the King of Jordan has stated that his country will take in as many refugees as cross the border essentially. Um, and from his point of view, he sees it as a religious imperative because the Prophet Muhammad was a refugee. And so he very much identifies through his faith with these people. And even though there's been huge strains on um, the public education system, on the economy, on the healthcare system, they, a lot of these Muslim people really see it as their job to take in their neighbors. Um, and you can really see that originally um, when you saw a lot of these border crossings, their families. Um, so you have two towns on the Syrian border, one is in Syria, one is in Iraq, but you have family members who live in that town over. And so when conflict breaks out, a lot of the people moving are going to live with their brother, going to live with their mother's family in a, in a surrounding country. Since then, obviously, we have millions of people moving out of Syria, and so it's gone a little bit beyond that. Um, but a lot of the kind of numbers that we're seeing in these countries are due to the fact that they're so close, both in terms of geography as well as culture, religion, all those kind of, kinds of um, variables are very similar for these people. Um, however, you look at a country like Libya, which has its own internal conflict. It isn't necessarily attractive in and of itself. However, Libya has a coast along the Mediterranean, um, and while you're seeing large influx of refugees, you aren't seeing a lot of asylum seeker applications because a lot of these people are taking boats, are hiring um, rafts to get into the EU, to get into Italy, Greece, um, even Turkey from here. 
And so um, a lot of it too is that people are try are using these countries to go into to escape the conflict initially, but are also using them as a gateway to other more attractive countries. As we have now addressed the issue of where these refugees are going and why certain countries may be more attractive to these refugees over other countries, I have um, conducted digital research on the ratios of uh, refugee populations that are in camps <clears throat> and refugee populations that are populating the urban areas of the neighboring nations and the nations that these refugees are migrating to. I have specifically focused on Jordan and Iraq as the case studies of, of, um, of this subject matter because the consequences of these migrations also needs to be examined in order to further address this issue. Um, however, as Sarah has just mentioned how the King of Jordan has um, posited to intake an unlimited amount of refugees, um, according to my data analysis, it shows that the sources and the capacity of um, the camps that are established for the refugees are now saturated. So considering this discrepancy between the realistic conditions and also the statements of the King of Jordan, we need um, a more realistic um, solution to um, solving the issues of the inhabitancy of, re uh, of refugees. <clears throat> Um, and also, um, looking at the year um, 2015, which my data focuses on um, primarily, there was a more of a plateau kind of tendency in the increase of refugees in camps, which shows that some of the infrastructures and also um, resources that have been allotted for the refugees are now most of, mostly um, saturated, and there needs to be a breakthrough in order to further um, ameliorate, ameliorate the living conditions of the refugees as well. However, I would like to um, bring attention to the point that the percentage data and the actual number data may sometimes show discrepancy because there is only a minuscule change and variation um, in the actual numbers which might go against um, what the tendency data suggests. So um, if anyone with um, plans to refer to this data, um, those points needs to be addressed and taken into account. Um, so. As we conclude our project, um, I would first like to mention that because the Sierra refugee crisis is an ongoing phenomenon, there could be um, ramifications and sociopolitical implications that we might not be able to foresee. And it has, because it involves so many political institutions, nations, and organizations, <clears throat> um, it will have a further, it will have very big um, impact even after the violence in Syria decreases. Um, and also it has um, greatly contributed to the shifting of international relations since its outbreak, as many um, superpowers or um, very existing social um, conflicts um, play into and takes a role in the Syrian refugee crisis. And I hope this project is a useful reference for those who want to get a broad um, idea of the Syrian refugee crisis and would further reference it for a more deeper study in um, the subject matter. And before concluding, I would like to invite Jenna to talk about the current situations um, uh, re um, regarding the Syrian refugee crisis. So this doesn't as concretely have to do with the work that we put into the website, but we didn't really feel that it would be appropriate to end a presentation on the Syrian refugee crisis without mentioning a little more in depth what happened in Paris over the weekend with the terrorist attacks orchestrated by ISIS, which is what we know right now. So what we think is that there are potential huge ramifications of what went on and that this isn't only because retaliation from France and its allies against ISIS, which exists largely in Syria. And as a result of that, that increase in violence will, of course, lead to more and more refugees in addition to the significant, amount, significant amounts that already exist. And besides that, you also have begun to see, and will see probably more in the future, major changes to policy. So. Everything that we've done for this website was done, of course, before the terrorist attacks. So 
the policies that we've discussed and the flows that we've discussed don't reflect these changes that we think might happen. And in large part, that is probably going to be the policy towards Syrian refugees in European states. And that's not only because of the increase in refugees, but because what we're told is that some of the terrorists who attacked France were actually brought into France by being smuggled in with refugees. And that makes it clear that it's obviously very difficult to distinguish when you don't really know much about these people coming in, who they are, and if they're actually part of an organization. And as a result of this, we've already seen borders close. We've seen greatly increased security checks that are likely to continue and have even greater ramifications for this current Syrian refugee crisis than the things that we've already discussed. I'm Patrick Schutz. Um, I helped build this website with Lee, and that's our presentation. So we'd like to thank you all for coming and listening, and hopefully this proved insightful into the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, we will provide a link to this website's permanent home uh, in the comments with the video.